I love my job. It gives me the chance to let you get to know some of the treasures in our community, and it gives me the chance to talk to some of my heroes. One of them is Terry Gordon, Dr. Terry Gordon, and he joins us next on Newsnight. This is Newsnight for October 12th, and I'm Jody Miller. You know, there are a few people in our community who have had the impact of our next guest. He is a devoted husband and father. He is a dedicated doctor, albeit he is retired, although the thousands and thousands of patients that he has served still adore him. He is a selfless humanitarian, a best-selling author, and he is even a doc who rocks. He is Dr. Terry Gordon. And next week, Dr. Gordon will be the 45th recipient of the Bert A. Polsky Humanitarian Award, and he'll be honored at a dinner sponsored by the Akron Community Foundation. Terry joins us now to talk about some of the accomplishments of his life. Terry, it's a pleasure to have you here. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, did I leave anything out in the description of you? Well, one very important thing. I love pulling weeds. Love I do. Weeds. I truly do. It's a grounding experience, and it gets me back to God and nature, and it's one thing I really do. I love pulling weeds. Well, after this, let's go over to my house, and you can help You're me on. do some. You're on. I'd love it. Um, I, tell us a little bit about Terry Gordon. I, I, I know you, Akron is your adopted community. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and uh, stayed there until I graduated high school, went to Emory University with plans to go into the pre-med program. A couple things happened, and I took a, a diverted path. Um, ultimately graduated with a degree in psychology, and then decided I really wanted to go into medicine. Went back and took all of my pre-med work, and then applied, got accepted to medical school. Went to school in uh, Kansas City, and then came back to Ohio, or came to Ohio, and did a rotation internship down in Maslin, residency at Akron General, and fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. And before we knew it, we've been here 30 some odd years, and we're Ohioans. It's, it's to our benefit, <laughs> obviously. We love it up here, we do. You, you um, are a trained cardiologist, obviously, but, but you are retired. I am. Okay. Um, but I want to go back to, to um, several years ago, because part of the Polsky Humanitarian Award I, in the press release, they talked about the efforts that you made to um, champion the automated external defibrillators, the AEDs. And, and, and I'd like you to tell our viewers how that started. Well, it was almost 12 years ago to the, to the day that Josh Miller, a 15-year-old high school football player from Barberton, ran off the football field. And he collapsed. And in front of his teammates and in front of his friends and Sadly, in front of his parents, Josh Miller died. He had a cardiac arrest. The kids aren't supposed to do that. I had the unfortunate experience to watch the video of Josh's death. And it was one of the most sickening things I've ever seen. In that normally boisterous stadium, you could hear a pin drop, except for the wail of his mother. And um, I took it on as a mission. I was then president of the local chapter of the American Heart Association. And I vowed this was never going to happen again in our community. And they told me I was crazy, uh, which I am. <laughs> but we came up with this idea to raise funds to put an AED in every junior high school and high school in our community. And a couple of months later, we had a little press conference. Josh's father, uh, Ken, was there with us. And at the end of the conference, the TV reporter shoved a camera and microphone in his face and said, you know, Mr. Miller, these... These AEDs, they cost almost $3,000 a piece. Doesn't that seem like a lot, of, a lot of money to you? And he looked down, he's a man of very few words, and he looked down and as he looked back up, he had a single tear tri trickling down his cheek. And he looked at me when he responded to her question. And he said, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot of money to me. And it was like a bolt of lightning that struck me, mm -hmm. that God was saying, okay, Terry, you, you think your purpose, your dharma is to be a cardiologist? Uh-uh. Your purpose is to save the lives of our most precious resource, our children. And we ultimately raised the funds. Akron General uh, provided a good part of those funds. And we succeeded in putting them in every junior high school and high school in our county. Uh, we trained 12 people in each school, and we gave them a free AED. Um, it was then that I thought, well, why stop at Summit County? What about Portage County or 
Davidson County or any other county. What about the country? And, and so I, I continue this, this mission, and it continues to this very day. Give us some numbers. How many AEDs have you been able to place in schools or police vehicles or, or state highway patrol cars? Well, the Ohio School AED Initiative uh, placed over 4,470 AEDs. Um, I would guess an, another 500 or so that, that I've participated in. But, you know, the important thing is not my participation, it's the fact that they've got them because they're very, very important. Uh, when, when somebody has a cardiac arrest, their heart starts to fibrillate. It, it quivers like a bowl of jello. That's what it looks like. And unless immediately resuscitated, shocked with a defibrillator, that person's going to die. In fact, every year in America, over 250,000 people collapse from a sudden cardiac arrest. Sadly, only 3 to 5 percent of those survive. And the reason being is that for every minute someone is in a cardiac arrest, every 60 seconds, his or her chance of survival drops by 10 percent every minute. Now nationwide, we've, and we've got the best paramedics in the world, but nationwide the average response time is 8 to 12 minutes. Which is too late to save somebody. You do the math and that's why such precious few survive. So it's very important that AEDs be placed everywhere. They should be in schools, they should be in high-rise buildings, they should be on golf courses, in shopping malls. They're mandated to be on airplanes and yet you have a 30 time greater chance of having a cardiac arrest in a school than you do on an airplane. You talked about broadening your efforts, and, and you also went national with this, and it's, it's what, the Josh Miller Hearts, Hearts Act. Okay. Uh, and actually, the, the very day that we completed the Ohio Initiative, and the Ohio Initiative, by the way, was not a mandate. Mm -hmm. That's a nasty word, apparently. So it was purely voluntary, and there were some schools, not a lot, that refused to get an AED, but the very day that we completed the task, we were actually in Columbus, announcing the completion. I, I received a phone call from our congresswoman, Betty Sutton, and she congratulated us on the event. And she said, uh, you know, Terry, do, do you think we could do this on a national level? And I said, no, ma'am, I don't think we can. And I remember her, a, a, a sigh that came from her. She said, oh, why not? And I said, I don't think we can. I know we can. And that wasn't cockiness. I was practicing something I didn't know the name of. It's called the power of intention. I already saw that program as being. It's like a, it's like a, a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, the, the picture is already there. All you have to do is put the pieces put the together. Pieces in. And that's, that's what I saw. And, and so it has been, uh, she actually took it from me and bolted the baton. And uh, within six months got the Josh Miller Hearts Act passed through the U.S. House of Representatives unanimously, I might add. Unfortunately, it did not make it through the Senate. The following year, she proposed it again. Once again, it didn't make it through the, the Senate. Currently, she's proposed it a third time, mm -hmm. and it's been proposed on the Senate side by Senator Sherrod Brown. What are the possibilities of it passing? Well, it's going to pass, because I've already seen it as being. Okay. All we have to do is convince the legislators. <laughs> um, but, it, 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 you know, and certainly in the next couple of months, nothing is happening right. until the, the election's over. But we're hoping, because, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's an easy sell. Right. It's the right thing to do. Well, you brought with you a trainer AED, correct? I did. Okay. I did. Now, now is, is, is some of this the fear of using this correctly? Is this so complex mm. that people think they're going to screw it up or hurt somebody? They think it's complex, but we train seventh graders and paramedics at the same time with the use of this unit. Mm -hmm. It took the seventh graders a whopping 29 seconds longer to figure it out. The Good Samaritan Law covers you in the use of this. There is no way you can hurt somebody with this. If somebody has a cardiac arrest, they're not going to get any deader. I know <laughs> okay. that sounds funny, yeah. Yeah. but, but, but they are. Not, the only thing you can do is save the life. And the worst thing you can do is wait for the paramedics if you have an AED, a defibrillator, available. So it's voice activating. It tells you what to do. And if you don't do it, it'll tell you. Have you ever seen one of these? Before? I have not okay. seen one All right. Of now, let's, okay. let's play like I just had a cardiac arrest. Okay. Okay. What would you do with this device? Um, I would... Turn it on. Okay, go ahead. Now just follow the instructions. Call for help now. Now, if there's someone with you, tell them to go Remove call 911. Clothing from chest. It's telling you to take the clothing off the chest for a woman. The bra has to come off for a man. The hair on the chest has to be shaved, and there is uh, a razor included. Okay. So it gives you time to do that. Okay. Pull red so pull handle the red handle. To open bag. Go ahead, yank it. Okay. 
inside here each pad are, are two patches, okay? And apply pad to exposed chest. And it even shows you where on the chest you should put them, okay? And it's color coded. Color coded. So, okay. Remove clothing from chest. Okay. And then you put the patches on right. the bare chest, right. bare skin. Do not touch now, patients. It's looking at the heart rhythm. Okay. Evaluating heart rhythm. It uses the same algorithm we use in the hospital. If I need a shock, it will shock me. If I don't, it Stand won't. Stand by. Now it's telling you. Preparing hmm? to shock. Everyone Move away. clear. Do not touch patient. Delivering charging up. shock. Shock delivered. Did you get a shock? No. Oh, okay. But I just. Oh, you jumped just a. But you just saved my life. And it took us, what, 45 seconds to do this? The paramedics are still on the, or the you're still on the phone with 911. And the, let me tell you, the paramedics would much rather come to the scene of a cardiac arrest and have me sitting up talking with them or a child sitting up laughing and talking with them than dealing with perhaps someone who is now going to be vegetative because they haven't had proper circulation to the chest. It is so simple. It is so simple. It's, it, it's brainless. It, it really is. It, it, it's a no-brainer. This device works. You know, when, when if you have a cardiac arrest and you do nothing and just call 911, mm -hmm. your chance of survival is 3 to 5%. If you do CPR only, you double your chances of survival, mm -hmm. 6 to 10%. If you do CPR and provide a sh an early shock from a defibrillator, up to 50% of the people will survive. It's a no-brainer. We are going to continue our discussion with Terry because I have some more questions I want to ask him about this equipment, this life-saving equipment, on Newsnight.net. For more Newsnight content, including extended discussions, full interviews, and the chance to speak your mind about the issues, join us online at Newsnight.net. Terry, there's a couple of other points I want our viewers to understand about the 8Ds. The, the, talk about the batteries and, and the pads themselves. Well, the, a battery expires. It, it depletes whether you use it or not. So every couple of years, the patches have to be replaced and the batteries have to be replaced. So they need to be monitored. They need to be managed. The worst thing that could happen is to have one of these needed and find out that the battery is dead. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important part. Um, the other issue is, since Betty Sutton first proposed the bill in the U.S. House of Representatives in 2008, 206 children have died of a cardiac arrest. 206? 206 children have died of a cardiac arrest in our schools. And that's actually an underestimate because there's no registry. There's, there's no law that says you have to, to call anybody when there's a cardiac arrest in the school. But the travesty for me is all the while our children are dying. This bill is languishing. It's, it's First of all, I want to thank you for every, your efforts in, in the AEDs, the life-saving devices themselves, but, but I want to switch gears here. Um, in July, you became a published author. Uh, you wrote a book called No Storm Lasts Forever, and it's a chronicle of the journey that your family has taken since June of 2009. Tell us about that journey. Mm -hmm. Well, my daughter, Maddie Rose, had just come in from Chicago where she was teaching and I was upstairs actually working on another book and you, you know it's a parent's sixth sense you can kind of tell when something's not quite right and she, she just had this sadness that dripped from her and I said what's up sweetie and she came over and she plopped down by my knees and put her arms up on my knees and she said you know dad dad I always thought that the older I got the, the more control I assumed over my life the easier life would become and then with this deep sigh, she said, but you know, it just seems like it's getting harder. And I pulled her up in my arms and started rocking her as I always had for 30 some odd years. And, and I thought long and hard because I knew what I was about to say to her would be very important. And I shared with her, I said, you know, darling, I think that's how it's supposed to be. I think that if we are to progress, if we are to grow spiritually, we must face greater and greater obstacles. And I, I quoted her from the Kabbalah, which is the ancient mystical text of Judaism. And it, it says, the falls of our life provide us the energy that propel us to a higher path. It's the falls of our life and that we really should be grateful for the crap that comes our way. And I kissed her on the forehead and left her with that thought. The next morning at 640, I received one of the worst phone calls a parent could get. 
the gray voice on the other end of the line informed me that our son Tyler had been involved in a car accident, that he had shattered his neck, and then came the dreaded words, your son is quadriplegic. But you can't imagine. I mean, you worry about those phone calls, you fret when your kids don't come in when they're supposed to, but when the words hit you, you can't imagine the impact. And within about an hour, I had hastily packed the bag because I knew what was going to happen. They were getting ready to life flight him from Durango, Colorado to Denver where he would undergo emergency surgery. And I had to get to him right away. And I bolted from the house and sped up to the airport and somehow got on an overbooked flight, one that would get me there in time to see Tyler before they whisked him into surgery. And I was seated by a window and I was like a caged cat. And I was now incommunicado, and I didn't know if Tyler was alive or dead, brain damage, bleeding out from internal organ injury. And I remember I, I felt like I was in this tornado, and it was loud, and it was whooshing, and it was dank, and, and it was dark. And I looked down the funnel, and it was just pure blackness, and I was so frightened. And I remember praying deeper than I'd ever prayed before, Jody. And I wasn't praying for me. I was praying for those I loved. I was praying for Tyler and for Angela and my wife and my children. And I just remember saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And gradually this loud whooshing went away. It gradually abated as I was being enveloped in this cocoon of white noise. It was this place of unfathomable peace. And I kept saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. And, and I can't tell you that I heard the voice of God, but I heard the words of God when he said, Yes, you can. And I said, but I don't know how to do this. And he said, Terry, just yesterday, you shared your truth with your daughter. Just yesterday, you can talk the talk, but now you're going to have to live it. And I remember saying, but, but how do you do it? How can I do this? And, and God reminded me that everything is in perfect order, even this. And then the most profound thing was said to me when God said, Treat this as if it was something you had chosen. Now, why would I do that? Why would I choose a, a catastrophe like this? You know, something so bad to happen to my son. And what I ultimately came to appreciate, and, and perhaps the biggest challenge I had, was adjusting my perception of these events enough to recognize the presence of God within them. And in order to do that, I had to allow my mind to go way, way beyond what I judged as good or bad. And it set me off on a totally different path, a peaceful path, believe it or not, a peaceful path to, to enable me to handle this, to enable me to, to bring my family along. You spent many months in Colorado mm -hmm. as Tyler worked his way toward stabilization. What were those months like? They were not much fun, I'll tell you. It, it was very frightening. Um, there were times where he was very unstable, mm -hmm. especially early on. Um, but it also became fodder for growth for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that time? That four month period, especially. Um, and I started journaling. And I'd never done that before. Actually, my good friend Wayne Dyer, Dr. Wayne Dyer, suggested that we do that. And I started journaling, and, and I found, I'd never kept a diary or anything like that, but I, I found that putting my thoughts down in words allowed me to leave them, come back at a different time, and contemplate them in a totally different light. And it would allow me then to get off on tangents of thought that I never would have thought of had I just experienced that one time event. And it was that journaling that became No Storm Lasts Forever. Mm -hmm. They're actually love letters to my son. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm hoping at some point that these words will help him on his path as he traverses his storm. Terry, how do you say, stay so, so resolute, so strong, and so positive mm -hmm. during times like this? Well, I've always been a positive person, number one. The other thing that I discovered, and you can't discover this unless you're in the midst of the quagmire, is that beauty lies right alongside the perceived tragedy. One morning, 
we, we were in an apartment juxtaposed to the, the hospital. And I woke one morning, and the sun was streaming in through the window. And it was beautiful. It was almost like there were little prisms of light just dancing around the ceiling and the walls. And, and I remember opening my eyes. This was the first thing that I saw. And I remember being so appreciative. And I, I said, thank you, God. Thank you. It's such a beautiful day. And then suddenly, whoop, I was sucked back into it when I realized where we were and what we were facing. And I remember feeling so guilty because I was, because enjoy- you felt that way? I was enjoying something when my son wasn't. Oh. And then it hit me. Why shouldn't I enjoy the day? It's there. That beautiful day is right. It's like a little puppy dog sitting by your side, just waiting to be noticed. And I started then seeing things that I hadn't allowed myself to see before. Beautiful things. Flowers, people, a touch. And it it, it just kind of grew into this attitude toward life that, you know... This life that we experience, this realm that we call life, it's perfect. It's the perfect scenario for us to, to succeed in what we're all trying to gain, and that is insight. You know, none of us is immune. We're all going to experience this stuff, this bad, seemingly bad stuff. But the key is that the bad stuff is perfectly balanced by those things that provide us pleasure. And it's only through experiencing both that you really experience life. Again, the Tao Te Ching talks about the non-duality of life. There's no such thing as good and bad. There's no such thing as light and darkness. You have to have cold until you, uh, if you're able to experience warmth. So they're all one and the same. And you have to accept that and rejoice in them. So that's how I stay positive. I, pick, I, pull, I pull weeds. I love it. <laughs> Terry and I are going to continue our discussion on Newsnight.net. On Newsnight.net, we cover a broader range of topics than we can on the air in 27 minutes. Be part of the conversation on our Facebook page and at Newsnight.net. Welcome back to Newsnight, and I do urge you to go to www.newsnight.net for the extended discussions because some of the best parts of this program are on the Internet. But, Terry, we're going to switch gears for a third time here, and we are going to talk about something that, of everything you've done, has probably made you so popular and so well-known, and that's Docs Who Rock. Um, This was a fundraiser that you co-founded years ago. And in fact, this year's Docs Who Rock is coming up uh, on on October 20th. Right. So so, uh, tell us about Docs Who Rock. Well, it is an awesome night. This is the ninth year. Um, We started at the uh, Akron Library, 500 seats, and sold out within two or three days. Then went to North High School, sold that out in a couple weeks. And since then, we've been at E.J. Thomas Hall. It is a hoot. It's a great night. We have this year 12 bands, and uh, we've even turned down some bands because they weren't good enough. That's how good this is. This is a very professionally run show. We have professional lighting and cameras and videographers. It's a marvelous, marvelous evening. How do you get docs to let down their hair? You know, how do you how do you bear your soul? It, you know, it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. You know, I, I think what most of us feel is, you know, a lot of people put us up on a pedestal or they think we're kind of rigid, and this is a way to show our humanity. You know, and some of us show it in little different ways. Now, I will tell you this: my mother doesn't really appreciate some of the shtick that I have done on Docs Who Rock, especially when, you know, I'm kind of dressing and drag. Well, and we need to let the, our viewers know, <laughs> our, this, this is a man who has impersonated Michael Jackson, John Lennon, Lady Gaga, um, Barry, Manilow. Barry Manilow, you know, you you have no fear. No, I don't. Ike and Tina Turner, oh. um, <laughs> Mick Jagger, Rod Stewart, Austin Powers, uh-huh. so they're, you know, and it's, they were my alter ego, so every year I come up with a couple of of different ones. How about this year? Well, I can't tell you because if I did, I'd have to get the Terminator out toward you. Uh, yeah. uh, all right. Well, well, don't we'll, have to, that. we'll have to wait to that. Yeah. But, but talk about the kind of money that maybe mm-hmm. you have raised over the years mm-hmm. with Docs Who Rock because this is a United Way fundraiser, it correct? Is. It is. And we've raised over $100,000 for the United Way. Wow. 
just having a good time. You know, we usually get uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people to come to this thing. It's, it's really one of the best kept secrets because the bands are phenomenal. They're not just good and they're not amateur. They are phenomenal. And we have rock and roll, we have some bluegrass. We even had a concert pianist that won the concert, uh, Dr. Todd Byer. Uh, so it's an awesome night. It really is. And there are still tickets available. There for, are. Okay. There are. October okay. 20th at E.J. Thomas. And be there call. or be square. There you go. Yeah. Well, we, we just have a few minutes left, and I do want to congratulate you on your Polsky Humanitarian Award. It is much deserved and a long time coming. Um, what does this mean to you to be honored in this way? You're the 45th recipient, and, and there, it's quite an honor. Well, if I told you I was shocked when they asked me, I, I'm just so humbled by this. You know, to be included in such an esteemed group, you know, there's... John S. Knight and John Cyberling and E.J. Thomas and Dr. Auburn from the university and Dorothy Jackson, who has given her entire life. Um, you know, just to be included in that esteemed group is just mind-boggling. But I, I'm so humbled by it. I really am. I, uh, um, it's just such an honor. That's it. I mean, mm -hmm. given all that you have done, it's, like I said, much deserved mm -hmm. and uh, very well thought out. I'm so glad they have done this to you. It will be, you will be presented the award on October 16th, I believe. October 16th, right. Okay, all right. Caroline Hilton. Well, congratulations again on Thank that. You. Um, what's next for you? Well, you know, certainly with the book, trying to get the message out. I've got uh, a novel that I've finished. Um, Fiction? Oh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's called My Heart Will Go On and On. There's a song. Yeah, well, that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. But um, that, and I'm writing uh, my third book in the process of that. Okay. And, and many, obviously, many more weeds to pull? Yeah. It's the one thing God always gives me. He gives me <laughs> plenty of weeds. <laughs> well, it's um, been an honor Thank and you. a pleasure. It's been an um, honor. Like I said, you are one of my heroes. So um, I would like viewers to know that if they would like to know more about my hero here, Dr. Terry Gordon, he has a website. It is www.drterrygordon.com. And you can go to that and find out all the wonderful things that this man has done. Terry, thank you so much. Oh, it has so been such you. an honor. Thank you. And my thank, pleasure. thank you for joining us on Newsnight. Good night.